Hey, Andreas. Thank you so much for everything that you've done for the Bitcoin community and open blockchain. Thank you. Um, my question to you is, uh, just how secure is Google Authenticator? Um, is there a way that you can hack it as a middleman or something like that? Thank you. Um, that's a great question. Uh, Google Authenticator, uh, which is a, a one-time password two-factor authentication system, is basically a system that has a private key that installs on your phone. How secure that is depends on how secure the phone is. So if you put something like Google Authenticator on an Android 5 phone that doesn't have a hardware security module, or as it's called in Apple terms, a secure element, then that key is floating around in memory, and there are other applications that you may have downloaded and allowed far too wide permissions, or that have some exploited some bug, and they can reach into the memory, pull that private key, and then they have um, your two-factor. Now, you hear all of that, and this is exactly the problem. Because this is the point at which a regular user goes, well, screw that, I'm not using two-factor then. I'll just use one factor, because clearly, as Andreas just said, this Google Authenticator, in one obscure scenario, could be compromised. The truth is that using that will make you thousands of times more secure than not using that. Because the alternative is you try to do something else, like use SMS two-factor, which is far, far more vulnerable. The truth is that most people have devices that are quite secure. Smartphones nowadays are quite robust devices. They're not as easy to hack. The smartphone you have is probably the most secure device you have. And it can store keys for small amounts. The truth is that having two-factor versus not having two-factor is the option. So yes, there are obscure vulnerabilities. Better yet, use a hardware one-time password two-factor device. Uh, YubiKey, now Google is making one. And these are devices that are hardware signing devices that store the keys on hardware. So, my laptop has a little thing on the edge, which I just have to tap every time I want to log in, and that stores the hardware keys. That's better than. But both of those solutions, thousands of times better than not. And that's really the calculation you need to think about. Hi, my name is Karen, and uh, the project that I work on works out in border towns in frontier markets, which is some of the places we are, are tough. One of the things we are running up into is the complete lack of hardware security at an affordable price for these markets. Uh, we know of people in the space that are working on this, but there's sub-$10 cards are, don't exist. And even then, onboarding merchants who are fairly sophisticated that use feature phones with uh, SIM cards for their online banking, but they still can't access credit. I this is the kind of security thing that I deal with day in, day out. Uh-huh. Absolutely. And, and the simple answer is, you, you have to wait. We're not ready for that yet. And it's important to realize that that doesn't mean it's not coming. And it's very important to realize that judging the technology or the market by what's available today misses the evolution of this technology. We're talking about a technology that, like many others, is affected deeply by Moore's law. It's affected deeply by exponential trends in technology development, in the kind of interaction between multiple different projects that all push together in the same way, in the lowering cost of um, electronics and consumer devices. If you miss that point, you'll look at it and judge it the wrong way. Just like. In the early 90s, if you looked at who owned cell phones in those days, when a cell phone was the size of a suitcase, I had a cell phone in 1991. It was about this big, and you retracted the antenna. Um, and the battery lasted for an awesome 15 minutes of talk time. Um, but I had it because my job paid for it, because I couldn't afford it. I can guarantee you I couldn't afford it. And the only people I knew who had cell phones at the time were millionaires. And I think what's ironic is that if you looked at that, you're like, this tool isn't helping the people who need help. Because you miss the fact that this tool will cost 
$10 in 20 years. And in fact, it goes from being a status symbol of being rich to the exact opposite, where the status symbol today is if you're rich enough, you don't have a cell phone, you have a secretary carrying a cell phone next to you. Rich people don't wear Bluetooth headsets. So that's basically the transition of technology from the ultra exclusive to the ultra uh, available for everyone and the drop in price. The first hardware wallet I bought, I paid a bitcoin for it. You're welcome, Alina. <laughs> it was worth it, but that's not a price at which we're going to take this market mainstream. There's already some hardware wallets that are dropping in price into the 20 or 30 dollars, and I, I hope we'll see more of those. My question is a little bit different. Maybe it's off topic, but it's related to the architecture for P2P. Please. So, uh, last year, January, uh, February, the uh, meltdown in Spectre came up. Uh, the computer research scientists at uh, Google and others found out there were flaws in the CPU uh, processor and the ability to secure the enclave. Yes. It's interesting if we look at the price of crypto coins since that point in time, they plunged into a dot com like crisis. Uh -huh. My question is, <clears throat> do you believe that we need to solve computer insecurity at the uh, trusted execution environment before we're going to come out of the, the flow and have the architecture for p 2 p um, yeah, that's a really good question, actually. Yeah, trusted execution environments are the, the core processing part that allows us to trust that our own computer is not hacking us while we're using it. I don't trust my own computer. Um, fortunately, there are solutions. Uh, the, the most effective solutions in um, cryptocurrencies, in fact, are low-tech and offline. There are solutions that involve storing backup seeds as English words. Um, before we had that great technology, we used paper wallets, and we also have hardware wallets. And while the hardware wallets themselves may have problems with the trusted execution environment, they interact with the outside world through a very, very narrow, very well-defined channel, usually a USB serial channel which has a very specific protocol. It's, it's extremely difficult without access to the actual hardware um, in order to compromise it remotely. So we don't need a fully trusted execution environment in order to deliver very, very high levels of security and privacy on peer-to-peer -peer networks. Not, unfortunately not.